I'm going to welcome Simon Rashley Otis to the stage. Us web developers, we kind of like athletes. Athletes from a young and up and coming sport. We're all trying to find ways to literally raise the bar, make websites that load faster, that are easier to maintain and scale. And if we look at the history of high jump, the exact same thing happened. Athletes from around the world tried different sorts of techniques until they eventually gathered towards a technique looking like this, called the straddle. And the straddle became the de facto way, the best practice way of jumping to achieve the best re results for decades. Until one day, that guy, Dick Fosbury, did this. In the 1968 Olympic Games in Mexico City, with this new technique, he won the gold medal and in the process completely transformed the sport of high jump. Today's athletes all use the Fosbury flop as their go-to technique in competition. Here's what Mr. Fosbury had to say about that. I was told over and over again that I would never be successful. They said the technique was simply not going to work. All I could do was shrug and say, meh, we'll just have to see. Now the reason I'm showing you this is to underline the fact that us people, we do not like change. Whenever we spend time and effort learning things a certain way, if someone challenges this, well, we feel threatened and get defensive. This is exactly what happens in web development when someone challenges separation of concerns, or more specifically challenges the fact that we should only use semantic class names in our HTML. Semantic class names are named after the content they're styling, something like page-intro, as opposed to something like border-blue, how they look. And the idea is by sticking to semantic class names only, you end up with a HTML that has no design concerns and can be completely restyled with just CSS. That's something that CSS Zen Garden demonstrated beautifully in the early 2000s. Oh, come on. So all these dramatically looking different websites are actually just the same document styled with another style sheet. And that really sanctified the fact that design belongs in the CSS and uh, HTML shouldn't mix presentational concerns. So now, What's up with utility classes? I'm sure you all use some of these classes. They're easy to learn, easy to use, to apply on anything. Technically, they're presentational class names. They have visual concerns. But they're so handy that no one really complains about using here, and there are a few. But when someone takes the concept to the extreme and starts creating scales for font size, font weight, padding, margin, opacity, even flex layout and everything, and then suggest that you throw hundreds of presentational concerns all over your HTML, then people get hung up. This is really controversial. It goes against everything we've learned to do. Quite frankly, it looks like a mess too at first sight. It's as controversial as it can get. If you haven't seen it before, I believe some of you would have, here are buttons from a library called Tachyons. And the HTML for these buttons looks like this. Now, when you encounter utility composition for the first time, and I see a few faces in the audience, you, you're a bit confused. <laughs> you initially don't really like it, and it starts brewing inside you. And you start thinking, oh, you gotta be kidding me, this is unsemantic, this is wrong, this is so much duplication, it's like inline styles, what, I hate it. Did I mention that people do not like change? It is especially true for the ones who spent effort and energy advocating semantic class names to demonstrate their benefits. For them, it feels like a huge blow because it feels like we're ignoring them and we're making a huge mistake. These are leading figures in our industry, so having opinions like this creates a huge divide in the CSS community. Cristiano Rastelli has a wonderful talk that documents it called Let There Be Peace on CSS. That's also available as a blog post. I encourage you to check out. What I suggest you do, we do for the next 30 minutes or so is we stop assuming that people are dumb and making mistakes and ignoring the past. Instead, maybe we should assume that we lack context to understand how someone came to the idea of doing something like this. So open your mind and follow me on a little journey in the real life of utility first CSS. Sorry about this clicker. In April 2015, I joined a company called Society One. 
I was brought in to help design, build, and maintain the company's marketing website. We were a really small team of two, a designer and myself developer. Complete freedom on the design on the tech stack, that was ideal. We built a simple static site, and we used foundation CSS, but mostly for the navigation and grid columns. And the majority of the site was built with custom CSS following the BEM methodology. Everything went great. We, after a couple of months, launched a new site live. Everyone loved it. Eventually, we ported this static site to Craft CMS to, to empower the marketing team with content editing, and the team loved the simplicity of Craft and how quickly we could implement new features. But also, a lot more people started getting involved. Over the following 12 months, the company went through a lot of change. Change in leadership, change in business goals, changes in company structure, we got placed under marketing since we were working on a marketing website. And while everyone meant well, we just ended up in a situation where there's too many chefs in the kitchen. And when that happens, typically you end up with a lot of inconsistencies across pages because different people might be owning different parts of the website. In terms of code, for myself, it translated into an almost never-ending flow of constant minor change requests, always very urgent which is also known as PAU. And that exposed, over time, one of the biggest flaws of the BEM methodology to me. The BEM workflow is slow and brain intensive. If you think about it, it wants you to do things the right way. Take a step back, think about clever naming convention, and decide if this belongs into this component or should be another component or a modifier. And when your workflow is too slow for the pace of change, you don't have any other choices than taking shortcuts. And well, when you take shortcuts with CSS, slowly things become hard to update. And eventually, you might have been there, things become almost impossible to delete. You can't for sure tell that if I delete this line of code, nothing's gonna break. So what do you do? At some point, you open a file and scroll to the bottom and write some more CSS. <laughs> because CSS is easy to write. And write. And write. And write, and write. You get the idea. <sighs> it eventually got pretty bad. Uh, a refactoring was a necessity at this point. My other choices, burnout, quit my job, not ideal. So I started looking into other methodologies or frameworks to do refactoring. And one morning, my colleague Matt sends me this Slack message. And he says, have you seen that tachyon thing? Whoa. Sorry. Hey, reveal it early. <laughs> Have you seen that Tachyon's thing? Uh, looks pretty cool, but crazy class names, I'm not sure. And I did not know about Tachyon's back then, so I took a look. And I saw this. And I didn't like it. Oh, so I, tell, I told Matt, look, Matt, this is, uh, this is wrong for so many reasons. We're not going to use that. There's just so many levels I'll explain to you, but forget it. And I moved on. But then I kept thinking, and I kept thinking about that tweet that you just saw again, <laughs> that tells me that I shouldn't uh, dismiss something just because I like context. And I didn't exactly have a better alternative back then. So I decided to do some homework, and I looked at Adam Morse, the creator of, of Tachyons, and eventually landed on this article, CSS and Scalability, which for me was a defining moment where I completely changed the way I think about CSS. In this article, Adam demonstrates just how much effort, research, struggles he puts into understanding how CSS seems to always break down over time systematically. And after doing a series of really compelling arguments, Adam drops the punchline. The best way to maintain CSS is to stop writing CSS. We're going to try to get it this time. <laughs> this statement resonated so much with me. Because I kept asking myself, how do we write maintainable CSS? But never once did I question the fact that we actually keep writing CSS over and over. And maybe the question is, how do we stop writing CSS? I'm sorry, I think it's because of the recording that the slides are jammed. And when you think about that question, how do we stop writing CSS, you realize this is not because of BEM or SMACs. 
The primary reason why we keep writing CSS over and over is because we're told to use semantic class names. Sorry, I'll just quickly uh, stop the recording because it's just, sorry about that. That was a bad idea. <laughs> now we're playing the video, great. <laughs> All right, that should be better from now on. <laughs> so yeah, the, the idea when you use semantic class name is you assume that you don't want your HTML to change at all and you want to restyle it just with CSS. But the fact is, the majority of the time, you see your HTML will change over time, whether you want it or not. Let's take this simple example here. So we have a site that we built with BEM components. It's live in production, multiple pages. And one day you get this request to take that call to action and move it above the fold. It might sound familiar to some of you. And, but only for specific pages. So we take that block and we move it up here and place it there. And now we have this little problem that this gap here is a bit too big because of the white background. So one thing you could do is take the page intro component and remove the padding top, like so. So I have my page intro component, and I want to target specific cases where there's a CTA, so I create a modifier, page intro, dash, dash, no padding top. But meh, this is not semantic. If you really want to be semantic, we should describe the content. So page intro has CTA, I guess. So here's a good class name. Now, what are the odds that a couple of weeks later, maybe a couple of months later, in a completely unrelated event, something else happens. Say, the hero image here disappears on certain pages for a white background. Well, now I kind of want to do the exact same treatment. I want to remove the padding top on my page intro, but I wrote some CSS for it, but I can't use that because it doesn't have a CTA here. Dang it, I wish I just used no padding top because this is what I want to do over and over. And by sticking blindly with semantic class names, we end up wrapping and trapping very reusable CSS into non-reusable class names, which leads us to reinvent the wheel over and over for the same thing. And, oh no, not again. <laughs> <laughs> this is a lot of work and bloat for one little thing, a single key value pair, padding top zero, which would be a perfect use case for a utility class. Padding top zero, padding top zero, I can apply that to absolutely any element in my website. I believe people stick to semantic class name for the quest of restylable HTML, but also in fear, in false fear that unsemantic class names are breaking the web. See, we always hear HTML must be semantic, otherwise you're breaking accessibility, you're breaking SEO, and that's very true. But there's a huge misconception and confusion between semantic HTML and semantic classes. Your HTML markup must be semantic, yes. But the class name you use, the computer doesn't care. Use what works for you and your team. If you need to dig deeper to get convinced, I recommend this article by Nicholas Gallagher. It was written in 2012, but still somehow today feels ahead of time and groundbreaking. Besides, we gotta ask ourselves the question, do we really decouple HTML and CSS? Adam Wadden, that you just heard before, has a really nice take on it. He sees the relationship between HTML and CSS as a dependency direction, which happens to be a two-way street. If you use semantic class names, well, your HTML can be completely restyled, yes, but the CSS that you write is completely coupled to that HTML. It needs to know about the document structure, the markup, the class names. Now, when you flip things over and use presentational class names, your HTML has hard-coded design decisions, so yes, it has lost the ability to be restyled. But hello, your CSS on the other end stands proud free of document concerns and can restyle any elements, any HTML blocks that wants it. So in other terms, all you've done is invert the dependency direction from one way to another. But more importantly, both these approaches are valid ways to write HTML and CSS. Neither are breaking the web, and neither should be considered wrong. Does it mean you and your team should try presentational class names? Isn't the technique simply not going to work? I guess 
You'll just have to see. OK. That's enough. If uh, you still think that presentation with class names is a bad idea, this is fine. I respect your opinion. What I want to do now is get excited. I want to try to show you why people go from hating utility classes to absolutely loving them in a matter of sometimes days. If I had to sum up the benefits of the utility first approach in two words, this would be speed and simplicity. For starters, when well, you stop writing CSS, which is kind of a big deal, it's not exactly news that, uh, it's not exactly, sorry, it's not exactly big news that writing, finding names for stuff, naming CSS or naming anything is time consuming, right? And also when you stop writing CSS, you move your focus almost completely to the HTML, which has some kind of an impact because see, HTML is a local scope where when you work with CSS, you most of the time in the global scope. That's the difference between a setup where every little change you do, you have to consider the whole project scope and context to see if you could break something somewhere. Or really a situation where you have a one-on-one -on -one relationship between the page that you're building and your HTML markup that you write to build that page. No context switching. And this, my friends, has leads to a ridiculously fast workflow. And I mean ridiculous. It's something that you have to try for yourself before you truly understand. So I'll try to demonstrate. Say I received that design. I was going to do the Laravel website, but it's already built with utility classes. <laughs> so you receive that design, and you have to build it in HTML and CSS. If it's my task, my brain starts to immediately break things down without me thinking about it. There's a big blue background with some padding vertical and a big thick white headline. And then the main column here is, is kind of narrow, except for that pull code that sticks out and has a border blue to the left. So what you're about to see now is a video that plays at three, four times the normal speed, but it's a real one take cut of the workflow that you get when you work with utility first CSS. I'll start with HTML without any classes, and I have the tachyons library here in the document head. And I'll start just applying styles to my elements. And you can see here the headline, uh, the BG dark blue and padding vertical cis for the hero. And then our headline has a class of white font level one and font weight 900. And then that main column here is narrow, so we are gonna apply the max width level six, which is one increment. And the pull code a bit wider, we're gonna apply a max width level seven, which is just one step up from that increment. And it also has a border blue, which is uh, the width level three with padding left on the four. And you can see that I keep going and without ever leaving the HTML file or stopping to name things, I'm able to build this page relatively quickly when I'm done. How's that? <laughs> that is not too bad, right? But I know that very, very possibly, some of you right now in this room are thinking to yourself, yeah, okay, Simon, cool, but I mean, you may as well just use inline styles there because you're just applying the very same class to each element and it styles just one element. What's the difference, right? I mean, right? Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> Utility classes and inline styles are very different from a technical standpoint. How about hover states or pseudo elements? How do you handle that? Media queries. Take a look at this. This time I'm using Tailwind and I have a background, light purple, default background color, and then I have modifiers for the small, medium, and large breakpoints. So as the viewport gets bigger, the cascade does its thing and, and the styles get applied with normal CSS. What about specificity? Ah, revealing all the tricks. What about specificity? Uh, Inline styles have huge specificity where class name is just level 10, the smallest possible. What about the design restriction that you and your designer sat together to define a level six or seven of max width? Inline style, you can apply anything that you want. Also in terms of performance, utility classes and inline styles behave very differently in terms of the render tree. So if you have 10 times an inline style that says padding top zero, the, the rendering engine will have to compute 10 times the styles to apply them. But if you have 10 uh, MT0, matching top zero class names, 
the rendering engine will compute the first one and then skip the other ones because it already knows what to do with these styles. So at scale, that has huge impact as well. So I could do an uh, entire talk on uh, why inline styles and utility classes are different, but for now, as you've already seen, we'll consider that myth busted. I said before that you stop writing CSS, but the key is you don't have to stop. The idea is that you only reach out for custom CSS when it makes sense instead of inventing the wheel. As developers, we're really good at uh, over-engineering things and abstracting things too early, moving something to a component class without even knowing if we'll ever reuse it again. And that's the essence of the utility-first approach, which is a term coined by Adam, by the way, which is you build stuff with utilities first, and then you reach out for custom CSS where it makes sense, right? And if you like BAM or SMAX, I like BAM, you can totally do utility-first driven BAM and reach for BAM in the places we want. We had that discussion at dinner last night, actually. And as, to me, it's a much better approach, more convenient than doing everything with BAM because, well, we've decided to use BAM, so now we're gonna use BAM for everything, and BAM this and BAM that, which leads to duplication like we've seen before. All that to say, uh, I'm really happy that I reconsidered my decision and my initial gut reaction. I was going to completely dismiss tachyons just because it looked ugly, and it went against some principles that I believed in. But after doing this deep dive, I was completely sold on the concept. I knew I was going to rebuild the Society One website with tachyons. All I needed was a bit of time. And I knew my time was coming soon because we were a couple of weeks away from the Christmas break. This is it. Christmas is my one shot at a two week window where the BAU stops and I don't get interrupted and I can get stuff done. So it's worth mentioning that at this point I have technically zero experience building something with tachyons. I've done some research, I've played around, but I haven't built anything in production. I have two weeks during a family holiday. What could go wrong? <laughs> but again, I didn't have exactly a better alternative, so I decided to accept the challenge. And my wife and I took the kids and packed the car and ate anything that possibly fits in a car in a trailer. And like we do every year around Christmas, we went for a little road trip. We were camping up the coast, inland, and just find places. And for me, it's just another family holiday, except I happen to be working full time. From, <laughs> from wherever we may be on that given day. Now, as odd as that looks, this is in these conditions that I'm the most productive. I just enjoy working outside. If you follow me on Twitter, you may have noticed that. And think about it. I write some code around my family, and after two hours of looking at my text editor, I just look up to rest my eyes, and I see this. And then my lunch breaks look something like that. And that gives me incredible creativity and enthusiasm and energy to do my job better, and I get just really productive. Now, show of hands who's got kids in the audience, okay? Keep your hand up if you work from home with these kids sometimes. All right, so quite a few. There's a question I get very often because I share my camping stories, and people say, Simon, how do you go camping with kids? It's already impossible at home, I just, I can't. I have a tip for parents out there. Camping with kids is a life hack. When my, parent, when my kids sorry, are in the house, it's almost constant chaos. They steal each other's toys, they nag each other, they make each other cry, they get in trouble all the time. The minute we set out and go camping, everything sorts itself out. All of a sudden, they're the best friends in the world. They want to hang out together. They want to help each other. They just create their own world and enjoy themselves all day. It's, it's remarkable. They literally blossom with nature. And in the process, they get to learn about the important things in life as well, <laughs> and get a bit tougher and more resilient, which is, it's really good. Honestly, I, I, if you haven't tried and you're scared of camping with kids, it's the easiest thing. So what is my plan? I have two weeks, and I have too many custom BEM partials that are all used only once. Does it sound familiar to any of you? All these things are used only for one thing. And what I want to try to do is go and find places that I can replace with utility classes and remove some custom CSS. I'm also wary of the fact that I want to be able to merge my code back in production 
before the new year starts, otherwise my branch will just go out of sync and that's the end. And because of that, I decide to take a conservative approach. I'm not too sure what I'm doing, so I go with something that I call sugar on top, which is just sprinkling some margins, padding, maybe background colors over my existing CSS, just to get my feet wet with the new approach. So I have my existing uh, pipeline CSS, and at the end I add tachyons here, and I go hunting for places like here where I could replace this margin top with a margin top level four probably, and margin bottom with level one, something like that. On the very same page, the top headline doesn't have margin top because it's the first one, and that's a classic case where we have a custom BEM modifier to do one thing, no margin top. I kid you not, with the class MT0 from Tachyons, which is margin top zero, I'm able to remove dozens, maybe 50 custom BEM modifiers around the site that all do the exact same thing. They remove the margin top to certain elements. Just that MT0 class in itself for me was a refactoring win. And so I keep going and I get more comfortable with the approach and I remember fondly at some point where I went to refactor this the margin and padding for this uh, trust elements, logos uh, element. So it's a simple section with the UL and the LI. And initially what I want to do is go do the margins around the LIs like I've been doing. But as I'm doing that, I'm like, wait a minute, I can actually do the entire component with utilities fairly easily. I could have some flex classes around the container and then the URLs, I could reset the margin and padding and remove the bullets and the LIs, well, I've done the LIs already. And just like that, I can take these 30-ish lines of custom CSS never used anywhere else and remove it. And I realize I can probably do the exact same with a lot of these components. And at this point, my mind is blowing up because we've talked about the fact that it's almost impossible to delete CSS and here I am removing partials one after the other, honestly, without breaking a sweat. It's really easy to reason about. Where's the catch? It's almost too easy. Well, there was some sort of a catch. Is I got a little bit too excited with my sprinkling on top approach, and I mixed the approach that you would have in a utility last or versus utility first approach. So utility last is what I call sprinkling stuff on top of existing CSS. You have your CSS, and then you add some stuff on top where when you go utility first, the idea is that you have nothing else and you build from the ground up. And here I was kind of in between, which has implication because if you think about it, what if what you want to do is utility last, and that's fine, you can use just utility last, but what you kind of want is a really powerful hammer that just makes your utility win every time you slap it somewhere, like some sort of whack-a-mole game. And in that context, what is recommended is to use important flag on all of these utilities. But in my case, I was gearing up for utility first. I just hadn't removed the underlying CSS, which started to win the specificity war all the time because utilities are so low in specificity, which led me to a lot of time wasted and refactoring once I removed the rest of the CSS. But that was also a good sign that it was time for me to make a decision if I was ready to go all out. And what I mean by all out is remove all the CSS except tachyons. I was early in the first week, I still had plenty of time. It was worth a shot. So just for good measure, I created a new branch. And uh, <laughs> as, I'm, as I'm about to run Gulp, I'm really freaking out because what's gonna happen to the website? I remove all the CSS, it's gonna be completely out of whack and bracing and here we go. Hey, that's not too bad. I had. <laughs> I had played enough with utility classes that the background color, the text color, font size, font weight were already in place. With only tachyons, I was expecting way worse. The obvious difference here is everything that be, uh, relied on foundations, grid columns, what now stacked, like this footer or this uh, FAQ here, which is not a big deal. And it's also a perfect transition to my next step. The next step, I should be doing grids with utilities. So how do you handle grids with utilities? Magic? <laughs> Not really. You kind of have to know your way around CSS. This is one of these misconceptions that you can use utility classes when you don't know CSS, and that's just not true. You can use floats, you can use flexbox, you can use inline blocks, table, grid, whatever CSS offers to create columns. Or you could cheat a little bit like I did and use flexbox grid. 
Now let me iterate that you can absolutely handle grids with utility classes. No problem. The reason I went for Flexbox grid is step one, very short deadline. And step two, we were heavily relying on foundation's grid columns in our project. And the Flexbox grid uh, syntax happens to be almost identical to something you have with Bootstrap or Foundation's grids, which allowed me to just find all the places in my entire project that use Foundation grids and tweak the class names just a little bit, and it would start to behave responsively exactly like it was set up. So that allowed me to do all the grids of the whole website in a couple of hours, something that would have been at least two days to do by hand. But again, you can do it. That was just a developer convenience I thought was worth the trade-off. I think it's 14 kilobytes. It's a pretty small library, and it's pretty good. At this stage, the site wasn't ready, but it started to look so obvious that I was going to pull it off. Like, things were coming together, and this feeling of predictability and confidence kept growing in me, which is remarkable. There was one thing that I was worried about, as you can suspect, is I was starting to do a bit of a copy and paste mess with these utility classes. One of the things that you need to be wary of with utility classes is you're gonna repeat yourself possibly. So one good way of maintaining that is to have a HTML component somewhere that you write once and maintain and then reuse. So if you use Vue or React, you can have a component like this. Or in my case, if you use Twig or any templating language, Chances are you can have a partial that you just include or embed with special parameters to make it do what you want. In my case though, again with the short timeline, and we had a lot of HTML that looked the same, it was just a bit different in many places, and I would have taken a lot of time to consolidate all this. I couldn't do a refactor plus redesign in the same sprint, so to say, so I needed a quick and dirty way to have strings of class names stored in one place that I can reuse. So I came up with this idea of having a combo object. Don't know why I called it like this, but anyway, I would store keys like uh, separator, headline, buttons, and have the, the strings of classes I want to apply and reuse over and over. And then I would have my master layout that would extend the file that contained that combo object, which effectively would make the combo object available absolutely everywhere in my uh, page templates, anyone. So if I wanted to use a headline or a button, on any template, I could go combo that headline or combo that button that base. Now, this was a thought on the spot, completely do it yourself solution, but it ended up working really, really well for my use case. I don't necessarily recommend that approach from the get go. And if you're skepti skeptical about that, which I completely understand, just know that you can also do stuff like this in CSS. You can use extend to combine classes together or in the Tailwind library you might be familiar with, uh, you can find repetition of buttons like this, of class names, sorry, and then you can smoosh together these classes into a component class, like here, a button, with a post-CSS apply directive. So you can do the same then for color modifiers and add some hover state, and then your HTML suddenly looks like BAM, because you are using BAM, that's what BAM is but you're using BAM within the design restrictions that has been defined with the designer, which is really, really cool for consistency. So Tailwind came out a year later than I did my refactoring, so that wasn't available. I really enjoyed that functionality now, but I was quite happy with the setup that I came together. I had grids, I had tachyons only, no custom CSS, and now I had this way to stay dry with my combo classes. So I thought, at this point, I think, I'm ready to go page by page and put some finesse and see if I can rebuild the page exactly like it looked as close as I can. So I thought I'll start with the home page because it's the biggest page and I'll spend the day working on that home page and see how much time it takes, how far I can go on this page today and then at the end of the day reevaluate where I stand. By lunchtime, the home page was completely done. I knew I would be moving fast but I kept surprising me myself with how much faster I was moving than I expected. So I moved to the next page, the about page, etc. And eventually, on the 10th day since my, 10 work day since my initial git commit, uh, at nine in the morning, I pushed the 100% tachyons refactored branch into pre-prod, which is the branch that we end to merge in production. I had half a week left and I had pulled it off. That was an amazing feeling. 
Obviously, I was happy with myself, but let's talk about what happened at launch and maybe up to this day. Why did I do the refactoring in the first place? My initial need for refactoring was to remove as much tech depth in CSS that I could. I had no idea how much I could, just remove as much as I could in two weeks while camping. And turns out I had removed all of it. I was literally using only Tachyon's Flexbox Grid, which I don't consider tech depth, which in my books is a pretty good result. <laughs> Onboarding team members, because the team started growing, turned out to be very, very fast and convenient. Come on, you. Sure, people gave me the looks at the start, and they hated me for implementing this garbage utility class thing, but I think systematically, the system won them over in a really short period of time, which, yay, I think it's good. I had, more importantly for myself, though, my CSS anxiety was completely gone. I'm getting clicker anxiety now, though. <laughs> I used to dread every simple change. I used to resent my colleagues for asking me to do changes because honestly, I didn't know what I would break and I didn't know how much time it would take. All this urgent, oh, it's just a minor change, I would be freaking out. I realized that since the refactoring, BAU requests never stopped, never started worrying me again. Sure, like an urgent minor change, meaningless, still annoys me, but it doesn't worry me. I don't feel that panic, what am I gonna break? It almost became one of these games where I feel like utility first is unbreakable with BAU and I'm like, bring it on, come on. <laughs> you might know that guy. One thing I noticed within a few months after the launch is you really legit stop writing CSS. There's entirely new sections like the blog that this blog wasn't even in the discussion when, we, when I did the refactoring. And we are able to build this blog hub page and the single pages without writing a single line of CSS, the entire blog that wasn't even conceived or designed when we refactored, which to me is really trippy. It's a complete new stuff that looks completely different than anything we have in the website, and we built it without writing CSS. One of the benefits of that is if we look at the bundle size. So that's before the refactoring and it's not gzipped. It's just we had 275 kilobytes of CSS before the refactoring. Now, without any attempt to be fancy and not and remove the utility classes that we're not using or use something like Purge CSS, by just putting Tachyon's row and customizing it and building the site without worrying, the new CSS was less than half the size. And as you've seen, as you keep building stuff, you don't really write more CSS. So again, for me, that's a pretty big win in my books. Now, the question that uh, I would understand you asking is, can't things just get messy over time with this whole copy and paste? And the answer is absolutely yes. I guarantee you, over two years up to this date, I've made a big mess of utility classes here and there. Because even if we have the these combo uh, classes that we can reuse. Some people would use something a bit different, so they would just copy and paste the, the, the combo, and we still have lots of inconsistencies. But here's the thing. Do I feel like I'm losing control again? And that, the answer is hell no. See, technical depth that you generate with utility classes lives in the HTML. Again, it's a local scope, and it's in your face. It looks a bit ugly, so you kind of feel like you want to fix it, and you can go at any time you have incrementally and fix one HTML block without thinking of breaking anything. So what I mean is you never end in a situation where some weird things start happening to your CSS, and <laughs> <laughs> for the life of you, like you cannot pinpoint what's happening without spending two hours, maybe two days or more, looking at your global CSS and like, what is happening? And you can't, that never happens. I mentioned Nicholas Gallagher earlier in the talk, and he sums it up perfectly in that article. He says, I'll quote, to reduce the amount of writing and editing CSS, you must accept to spend more time changing HTML classes on elements to change their styles. That's the trade-off, right? And he follows, this turns out to be fairly practical. Anyone can rearrange pre-built Lego blocks 
but no one can perform CSS alchemy. Which, I really like that quote, especially at scale, it's very true. Even for people that consider themselves very good with CSS, it becomes very hard. So, the million dollar question, would I do it again? Knowing what I know today, would I go back two years ago and refactor the site with tachyons? I think you know the answer. <laughs> Absolutely, I would. This refact... Ah, oh, jeez. <laughs> Revealing all the cool stuff. This refactoring was easily one of the most productive and fulfilling and successful things I've done in my career. I literally rebuilt an entire website while camping with my family in 10 days, and ever since, I have never felt in this company the CSS anxiety again. It's not all perfect, but it's perfectly easy to reason about and incrementally improve. I've also learned to enjoy the new workflows that come with utility-first CSS. One of the things I really like is it kind of blends the workflow that designers and developers have. If you think about it, when you use Tailwind or Tachyons or any other utility-first approach, even if it's your own custom one, you start by defining colors and spacing scales. And you define these things that will eventually generate for you a series of classes which designers may call design tokens. If you look at how a designer works, they do exactly the same. They start a project and they come up with colors and spacing and stuff. And then with these tools, they start prototyping. So if you've seen a designer at work, they usually will duplicate stuff many, many times. And depending on the designer, it can go to epic proportions. But at this stage, they don't care at all about naming things. If you look at the sidebar, it's all copy of copy of copy of number two. And it's just an efficient way of discovering stuff and not slowing down. And eventually, when they find something that works well, they will make it cleaner and then start probably naming layers like headline, buttons, etc. etc. And the fact to have these design tokens in code allows you to do the exact same thing. You can start iterating and look how here I'm playing with the line height, uh, line height, font size, font weight, font colors, and even border radiuses because I have these little design tokens I can play with and prototype in the browser. And again, without ever stopping to name thing or think of too much stuff, I'm able to build this responsive, pretty cool card component in a minute or two. Another really cool thing that you get from having the design tokens in code is, well, you can import them in your front end. Here I have Vue.js and I import the entire Tailwind library uh, sorry, the Tailwind config file, which happens to be in JavaScript, so I import it in a property called design system, and oh my god, I have access to all the colors, the padding, the spacing, the breakpoints, and everything. Which means now I can really easily spit out a self-documenting style guide that will loop over all the iterations that I have and always stay up to date. If we go and change something in the source of truth, which is the Tailwind config file, which is the design tokens, well, this document will immediately, as soon as you refresh, rebuild and always be in sync. After a while working with Utility First CSS, you take all this for granted. You're like, this is how front end is built. I really like, I know I keep mentioning Adam, but I really like this tweet I could relate to is, for me, I had forgotten how good we have it until you go back and edit a website that you built yourself with traditional ways, with like BAM or custom CSS. Even if this website is built superbly and you're proud of it and it's nice and it's been kept well, you will realize how much slower and clunkier the workflow is because you constantly have to go in the CSS to understand what this class is doing, etc. To wrap it up, uh, two days from now, on Saturday, it will be exactly 50 years since Dick Fosbury completely transformed the sport of high jump. May that be a reminder that today's best practices are not necessarily the final destination. There's more than one way to build websites. If you find a way that allows you to raise the bar without breaking the web, even if this technique might look weird and odd to some people, you're doing something right. You shouldn't listen to people telling you that you're doing it wrong. Finally, Utility First CSS is not for everyone and not for every project. For me personally, it allowed me to uh, raise my personal bar of what I do 
with uh, web development. It made me a faster, happier, more confident front-end developer, and I really, really enjoy working with utility-first CSS. And I hope you enjoyed listening to me telling you why. Thank you very much. I'm pretty sure there's no time for questions with the hiccups, but as you can see, you can talk to me during the conference or even after the conference. I always love talking about that stuff. Thank you.